Okay. Um, you should have seen me. I was kind of tangled up in this back there. <laughs> and so, <sighs> happy Sabbath, church family. The last time I was given <laughs> this pulpit, we were still in lockdown phase. So I preached to an almost empty sanctuary. But today, it is a blessing and a little bit intimidating, I have to say, to see so many that are here today. And, uh, but before we start in on today's message, I wanted to remind some of our congregation here about the important day that is coming tomorrow. Does anybody know? Mother's day. <laughs> it's Mother's Day. So tomorrow is Mother's Day. As I stand here thinking of all the sacrifices that my own mother has made for, uh, for me all the years, my early years, I won't tell you how many, um, I realize there is nothing I can do but thank her, to thank her enough. But since she's sitting here, I will thank her. Thank you, Mom, for everything that you've done. I have a few slides of cartoons and memes that I have seen in the years past on social media that illustrate the life of a mom. And I thought it would be fun to share it with you all today. It really wasn't until having my own children that I fully realized the sacrifices that my mother and all mothers make. And don't get me wrong, we have wonderful fathers too, but we all know that this happens, right? Oops, you know, this is so, <laughs> so fast. So notice all those questions that are to mom and then all the questions that are to dad. I know this happens in our family a lot. <laughs> so, um, just as I used to think that all the long hours of studying while in medical school were hard, then I graduated and became an intern resident when we worked 80-hour work weeks and 30 hours straight every fourth day. I thought that was hard. And then I graduated residency and learned how taxing being fully in charge of the lives of up to 20 sick kids and dealing with their families, sometimes a little crazy or dramatic, was hard. And that was hard. But... All these days were before I had kids. Now I think my husband knows that sometimes I go to work at the hospital to get a much needed vacation from what really is the most taxing job out there. Because we all know that this happens, right? I know it happens in our house. <laughs> and so does this. Because it seems that no matter how hard we try to be a good parent, we are faced with our progeny that think that they know better. But most of all, I think that the worst is when we mothers put on ourselves to be perfect at all times to all people in all circumstances. But once we learn the real secret that God has put us in the exact place he wants us to be, ministering to our children as our very own mission fields for Christ, that we learn to rely on him. And we learn to give and receive grace to ourselves as we become a good mom. And sometimes... Even our moms, our, our kids might actually recognize it. But it really is that in those moments, if it seems that I have it all together in the parenting world, it really is because I have all of you other great moms who have my back as much as I have yours. To all the mothers out there, I see you. I really see you. Happy Mother's Day. To those who may not yet be mothers, to those who are currently in the trenches of motherhood from the crate with children from the cradle to the senior or those who are part of the tribe of honorary mothers. May God richly bless you and continue to give us the strength as we continue to raise up a generation for God in these trying days, right? We all need it. <laughs> up until this past January, we were a homeschooling family. One thing that Mike and I take very seriously is that we want our kids to know their Bible more than any other book on this earth. Mike and I take turns going through different Bible story sets or Bible story curricula. But something my kids still love be right before going to bed is to hear a favorite Bible story from mom, unscripted. When Frank asked me a couple months ago to, to speak, one of the favorite requests of David at that time was a story of Noah and the Ark. And there is so much to glean from this story that I thought that we would spend a few moments looking deeper into the lessons that God has for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your life and your Sabbath as a day of rest in you. I thank you for the gift of biologic family and the tribe of church family we have here. But now I thank you for the privilege of standing here as your representative to my beloved friends here today and on the larger internet. May the world words that come out of my mouth be translated into clear and actionable message in the ears of the hearer 
so that your work may be done and we can all go home, Father, but not without that one that may still be unclear of their way. I pray that you will take me out of this message. Forgive me of my shortcomings and place your words into my lips so that this message is for your honor and glory only, Father. All these things I pray in your holy name. Amen. So friends, I don't think I need to tell you that we are living in the last days. If you don't know that already, I pray that you will pay close attention to today's message. Our scripture passage this morning is from Jesus' own mouth when he was asked about the last days. Let's turn back to Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of man be. You know, it's so nice to have this screen down here because I can actually see my, my slides. <laughs> um, but in Noah's day, there was an impending calamity, a worldwide flood. In the last day, we read in Daniel, Revelation, and many of the books of the minor prophets that there is an impending judgment for us all and that the world will just be destroyed by fire. My friends, God never gives us a challenge that he doesn't also give us a way out, an instruction booklet, a blueprint. So it stands to reason that if the last days are like the days of which Noah lived, then we should study his story to gain an insight into what we should be doing, right? But the story doesn't just start with Noah in Genesis 6. To know why the flood happened, we need to go back a few chapters to chapter 3. As you probably are familiar, this is the chapter about Adam and Eve's fall from perfection and the curses placed on them as Eden is closed to them forever. Sin entered our world and into our genome. If you don't believe me that it actually entered our genome, then listen to this. There's actually now a known scientific phenomenon that epi called epigenetics. This is a study which external factors can modify the gene expression of our genes. In other words, our behaviors and environment can change our DNA to either turn on or off a particular gene. Science now knows that these epigenetic changes can be passed through the sperm and the egg. Science now knows also, or so as an example, if a pregnant woman's environment and behavior during their pregnancy is harmful, such as her food intake or her stress levels, these chemical changes then can pass into her baby and may impact the baby's chances of getting certain diseases decades later in life. Or a man who makes one or more bad choices, even toxic thoughts, can change his gene expression. If he, that man with the toxic thoughts, then impregnates a woman, that child could suffer a harder life from those fathers' bad choices. Females have at birth within their ovaries all the eggs she will ever have in her lifetime. So if that father, with the toxic thoughts again, donates the correct chromosome to make a female child, then it is possible that each egg in that female fetus will then have the same copy of the epigenetic instructions from the original man with the toxic thoughts again, when that same harmful ep epigenetic change could be passed on to a third generation all within a few moments of that original toxic thought. Isn't that scary? That's scary, isn't it? So it's not, so it's not to, um, to it's, we can understand how during those generations uh, between Noah and, um, and on, that all of a sudden the earth would be, become so um, evil. Genesis 4 gives us a story of Cain and Abel. We see their characters and thoughts by their actions. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White tells us that Cain's character was not disciplined as well as he should have been because Adam and Eve were hopeful that he was the promised Messiah. So they tended to spoil him a little bit. Cain grew up thinking that it was very unfair of God to have kicked out his parents from the Garden of Eden, and his whole life bears the consequences of these thoughts. Instead of following the divine instruction on how to worship, Cain offers his own, he takes matters into his own hands and offered a sacrifice based on works independent of God. Abel, as testified in Hebrews 11, exhibited a total faith and trust in God and obeyed his instructions. And we see the consequences of their thoughts into actions. 
God accepted Abel's sacrifice and sent fire from heaven to consume it. But Cain's offering received no such acceptance. And this angered Cain even more. And instead of taking responsibility for his poor choices, he struck his brother in cold-blooded murder. Even, be, even during this, the mercy of God, though, shines through. And he granted Cain mercy from death and as a hunted fugitive and put a mark on him so no one should kill him. Though you would think that they would encourage repentance from Cain, Cain was untouched by God's grace. And we see the last half of Genesis chapter 4 in the lineage through Cain. <laughs> oh, there, okay. So this is kind of the, a little graphic that I made that goes from chapters 4 and 5 to the very beginnings of chapter 6. So as you see right here, Adam is right here. He has two sons at first, Cain and Abel, but you see that Abel is X'd out. Hopefully you can see that. And so Je Genesis chapter 4 and 5 state that Cain then is banished and he's sent to live out in the valleys and the plains where he chose to live in the cities. And generation after generation after generation, that epigenetic stuff, that phen phenomenon that we had learned about earlier, got worse and worse. And by the fourth generation, he has a, um, there's a son called Lamech. And in Genesis 4, 23 to 24, we see that Lamech, where is this? So Lamech was practicing polygamy and setting himself as a law unto himself. From the very beginning of time, Satan has always attacked God's ideal of marriage because this is the image of God that Satan could never have. Did you realize that only when a singular man and a singular woman unite and cooperate will there be a recreation into a happy family unit? Early on, the sons of Seth, known as the sons of God right here, they separated themselves from the sons of Cain by going up into the mountains so that they would not be influenced by their bad, um, evil ways. But as you see, as time continues on, some of the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were beautiful, and they started to connect with them and to create another generation that unfortunately came more and more and more to the left, the side of evil, the side of self-worship, than the side of the right, which is righteous and God-fearing. And so by the time that it was Noah's time, there were very few that were faithful, and most of them were wicked. Did you know that some of the Bible scholars think that because the generations at that time were living just shy of a thousand years, some scholars estimated that the antediluvian population was about 10 trillion people. That's a lot of people, right? You wonder how, you know, could that be? You know, we can't all fit on this earth, but the earth was very different back then. And, they, and, and just in case you didn't know, antediluvian is actually the name of the people who lived before the flood. So in Genesis 6, 5 to 7, um, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and the thoughts of his heart were for evil continually. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White writes, if the, man, if the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, if it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love, the man will be constantly sinking lower and lower. But after the fall, men chose to follow their own sinful desires, and as a result, crime and wretchedness rapidly increased. Neither the marriage relation nor the rights of property were respected. Whoever coveted the wives or the possessions of his neighbor took them by force, and men exulted in their deeds of violence. They delighted in destroying the life of animals, and the use of flesh for food rendered them still more cruel and bloodthirsty until they came to regard human life with astonishing indifference. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man from whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So I understand in 2014 or around 2014 that Hollywood had made a movie about Noah and the flood. Some of you may have seen it, and that's great because I typically enjoy watching movies too. And I thought about watching this movie before giving this sermon, but I didn't. 
After reading and listening to a few reviews, I had no desire to watch this movie anymore because these advice columns confirm what I actually already knew, that Hollywood loves to slander the name of God. And from what I've heard from others, this movie was no exception. I'm sure that they had a heyday making God into a vengeful and authoritarian character. And perhaps, and maybe even Noah too. And perhaps reading on the surface of this verse that we had read, it almost seems that way from the narrative. However, instead of just looking at one or two verses, we need to look at the Bible in its entirety. And there are four, far more many verses that speak of the loving and merciful God that I serve than the opposite. If we tr fully study it out, Brothers and sisters, if we lived in a time where stealing and murder were so commonplace that we don't even hear about it in the news anymore, unless it is so heinous a crime as to shock us, and if people are having licentious relationships with an, one another, whomever they desired, breaking up family units either already made or having not yet made, and the image of God is trampled on so that those who find that they cannot fill the missing parts of their soul, that they would rather kill themselves than to go on living, then is it then so cruel to think that a loving God full of mercy would opt to put humankind out of its suffering and start over? Humans do that to animals that they love, don't they, when the, when the animals are suffering? God knew that to allow such a population to continue, they would only destroy themselves and everything around them. And friends, were you able to tell from my description whether it was the antediluvian world that I was describing? Or is it our current times that we're living in today? It's hard to tell, right? As in the days of Noah, so will also the coming of the Son of Man be. But... There's always that but there. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Amen. That loving, merciful God that we serve, he is so merciful, not wanting anyone to perish, but that all be saved. He found grace in the perfect, righteous man of Noah and gave him instructions on how to save himself, his family, and all who would listen from the impending calamity. You know, in high school, we had to read these long, boring pieces of classic literature, like Homer's and the Odyssey. <laughs> and that was so hard to understand and so laborious to trudge through that even if I actually read the words, I still had no idea what they were saying. Some of my friends had these book, you know, books called the Cliff Notes. You remember them, right? These books laid out chapter by chapter all the main points of the story and what kinds of questions the teachers may ask on a test test. On the first day of medical school during orientation, it was advertised to us, this glorious binder, one of these kind of publications that included every sample test from years past in all of our classes in our first year of medical school. Human anatomy, human physiology, microbiology, pharmacology, everything. It was a pretty penny, but you know what? Mike and I, we were lucky because we, we won a copy because we were the only married couple in our medical school class. But that particular book didn't help us as much as I hoped it would, be just because Mike and I don't study that way. But imagine how invaluable the information was that God gave to Noah. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The, the length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it uh, to a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters to the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the bread of breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all the flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds of their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you and or come to you and keep them alive. 
and you shall take for yourself all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to that that God had commanded him, so he did. Wow. So when God gives us instructions, he doesn't leave anything out. Noah received these instructions and right away set to work, as we see in Hebrews eleven seven. 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness, which is recording to the faith. So Noah hopped in his truck and drove down to the local Home Depot to order some wood so he could start building, right? No. <laughs> Ellen White actually tells us that Noah set out like a busy bee. He had to go to this forest, gather the wood, no one really knows what gopher wood really was. Some say that it's cypress wood, but we are told that this wood God instructed Noah to use was a, such a dense quality wood that it would not decay for centuries. He had to walk to the trees, cut the trees down, and then process them into boards for this massive boat. Given that the royal cubit in the ancient Egyptian times, which would be the time that Moses was writing the story down, was about 1.7 feet to the royal cubit, the dimensions of this massive boat was to be about 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet high. So, given the, that an American football field is about 100 yards long, or 300 feet, and the typical height of a floor story is about 14 feet, this boat was the equivalent of 1.7 football fields long, one half football field wide, and about 3.6 stories high. Or possibly like this. So did you know that in Kentucky, about 1,000 people working with the organization Answers in Genesis built a life-size model of Noah's Ark according to the biblical account. It took about 18 months to complete from starting in 2014 until they opened in 2016 as a museum to the public. Here are some of the photos that I saw posted on TripAdvisor by those who uh, were visiting the museum. So as you can see right here, there were three decks, remember? And on top of this picture, it wasn't pictured up there, but there was a window. And just as God had instructed, God has designed that the rainwater would come in through this window and then provide fresh water for all those inside the ark so they can store it uh, for, for themselves to use. Also, many of you guys have visited the zoo or a farm, right? You guys know the smells and the waste that have come from all those animals, right? So the rainwater also, by God's design, was to come in and flush all those, those waste products of these animals down into a, the very bottom deck, which pictured here, you can kind of see, was kind of like a storage septic tank. So that, you know, because God is a God of health, right? So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense that he would not provide for this, right? Isn't God just amazing, really? So some of these other um, pictures that I saw on the internet, this was actually from an article from, uh, from Christian Index, I think. I put that somewhere. Oh, it, you know, it, doesn't, it didn't actually say. Um, somehow it actually got cut off. But this man, Randy, who lived in Illinois, who visited this museum, said, it is amazing. This vi visit to Williamsburg helped me understand that Noah could have housed the animals and stored the water and food, that, and I couldn't read the rest of it, but it says basically that God had said in the Bible that happened in the ark. So that was pretty amazing to me. And so th um, there, this is some other um, pictures of inside their, their man-made ark of uh, what might have been the living quarters. And you can see that's a pretty good size, right? And th this is some of the living quarters for the animals. And so if you can imagine, um, as we look through this, oh, sorry, and here are the, um, remember how God had said that, you know, for Noah to start gathering the food and stuff for them to have in the ark? Well, there was plenty of storage room for all the food that he was going to get. And look, they even, had, they even had what they thought, imagined, that he could actually grow a few of the things that he needed. And this was all inside the ark. And if you see, there was lots and lots of storage space right here. 
And then they're in their imaginations, and of course, in modern day museums, we have to have restaurants, right, and gift shops, and we have to have malls like looking structures. And they were able to fit all of this into their man made ark that were built to the same sizes as what was said in the Bible. Can you imagine then, given, uh, as we scroll through the, some of these pictures, you can get an idea of the immense size of this structure. And I hope that that wells within your minds then. What a loving and merciful God we serve. Amen? Because if he only wanted to save eight people and a few thousand animals, he would not have instructed Noah to build an ark 1.7 football fields long, one half football field wide, and almost four stories high. No, he was saving room for any and all who would accept the message and be saved. Well, excuse me. <laughs> well, given that he had to gather and process his own supplies to build an ark, you could see why Noah, it, it took him 120 years. But amidst this time, he not only built, he preached too. For 120 years, he had one sermon to share, that the one, the one that God was going to send a flood and wanted to all who listen to be saved from the calamity. And while he preached, he lived his sermon. His faith was perfected through his works. All that he owned, he invested in that ark. No one could say that he was just blowing smoke because he acted on what he said he believed. Every strike of his hammer had the same witness as every word that came out of his mouth. My friends, this is the kind of people that God needs. Ones that not only claim to be Christians, but also live out the name of Christ. Noah was not alone. His family members and hired hands helped him build the boat and preach the message. But as he built that gigantic boat on dry ground, multitudes came from every direction to see and hear this strange man and his words. For 120 years they came. They listened. Then they despised, scoffed, and mocked. But Noah stood like a rock and a tempest. Surrounded by popular contempt and ridicule, he distinguished himself by his holy integrity and unwavering faithfulness. Connection with God made him strong in the strength of infinite power. For 120 years, his solemn voice fell upon the ears of that generation in regard to events, which were so far as from human wisdom could not, or could, sorry, <laughs> my eyes are a little bit blurry. Okay. So um, it says, for 120 years, his solemn voice fell upon the ears of that generation in regards to events, which, so far as human wisdom could judge, were impossible. Impossible. Friends, did you know that before the flood, there had never been rain on the earth before? From Genesis 1-6, we see that the firmament divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters above the firmament, as you can see from this graphic from Wikipedia. So right here, you have, uh, right, okay, there. So from, from this graphic we have here, this is the firmament or the earth or the, you know, the, the air that we have, uh, the atmosphere that we have, and this is the land. So there was water that was underneath the earth and there was water above our atmosphere. And you see these, I don't know if you can actually see, but there are these little holes, these windows or portals. And from those portals would the mist from above the firmament come and make a mist in, on the earth to water the ground. So they never needed rain. Um, where am I? <laughs> so, um, so with all human reasoning, it was not unreasonable that many did not believe him. And in doing so, they were unkind, to say the least. But Noah gained his strength to persevere for 120 years against mockery amidst hard labor because he had a solid relationship with God. Genesis 6, 9 said Noah walked with God, remember? Does that phrase ring a bell? Who else walked with God in the Genesis account? Abraham, the Enoch, right? Enoch walked with God. Let's go back to Genesis 5, 24. It's not working. <laughs> Um, so, so Genesis 5, 24, thank you, says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hmm. It seems to me that Noah got the raw end of the deal. 
Now, don't get me wrong. You know, Enoch had his fair share of preaching the, against the wayward world of his time, too. But Enoch walked with God, and God took him to live in paradise without ever seeing death. Noah walks with God, and God gives him 120 years of hard labor, hard preaching, and a life of scorn and mockery from almost everyone around him. Why is this, brothers and sisters? Well, Enoch was a representative of those who were faithful at the end times, who separated themselves from the rest of the world in regards to lifestyle, thoughts, and actions. In Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, Ellen White actually explains this further. Enoch, separating himself from the world and sp spending so much of his time in prayer and in communion with God, represents God's loyal people in the last days who will be separate from the world. God's people will separate themselves from the unrighteous practices of those around them and will seek for the purity of thought, the holy conformity to his will, until the divine image will be reflected in them. Like Enoch, they will be fitting for translation to heaven. While they endeavor to instruct and warn the world, world, they will not conform to the spirit and customs of unbelievers, but will condemn them by their holy conversation and godly example. Enoch's translation to heaven just before the destruction of the world by a flood represents the translation of all the living righteous from the earth previous to its destruction by fire. The saints will be glorified in the presence of those who have hated them for their loyal obedience to God's righteous commandments. Noah, by the same reasoning, will represent all the righteous who have been called to live through the last days, preparing for and warning the people around for anyone who will listen. They will be the ones who will witness to the world through a time of trouble before the close of probation as well as after. Finally, it was time for Noah and those who believe the message to get into the ark. Those were the, there were those who before Noah who believed the message and helped build the ark that would have been there, but they had died before the time to get on. And these represent the righteous dead who worked diligently for Christ in their day, but God mercifully chose that they would die before the last days. With an agony of desire that words cannot express, Noah stood there pleading with all his might that someone anyone would heed the warning and come into the ark before it was too late. But of course, the crowd continued jeering in rejection of his message. Sil suddenly, a silence fell upon the crowd. Read with me as Ellen White describes these tense events. Beasts of every description, the fiercest as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from the mountain and the forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. A noise as of the rushing wind was heard, and lo, birds were flocking from all directions, their numbers darkening the heavens, and in perfect order they passed to the ark. Animals obeyed the command of God while men were disobedient. Guided by holy angels, they went in two by two unto Noah and to the ark, and the clean beasts seven by sevens. The world looked on in wonder, some in fear. Philosophers were called upon to account for the singular occurrence, but in vain. It was, it was a mystery which they could not fathom. But men had become so hardened by the persistent rejection of light that even this scene produced a momentary impression. Mercy had ceased its pleadings for the guilty race. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air had entered the place of refuge. Noah and his household were within the ark, and the Lord shut him in. A flash of light, dazzling light was seen, and a cloud of glory more vivid than the lightning descended upon, from heaven and hovered over the entrance of the ark. The massive door, which was impossible for those within to close, was slowly swung into place by unseen hands. Noah was shut in, and the rejectors, reject, rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. The seal of heaven was on that door. God had shut it, and God alone could open it. So here's a picture of, um, of someone's realistic imagination of how massive that door of the ark could have been. A huge door like that, no wonder that it was God's angel would be the only one who would be able to close it. And as this invisible hand closed the door, everyone stood there watching because they didn't know what was exactly going to happen next. And what happened next? Nothing. Nothing. For seven days, there was nothing. Can you imagine the testing of faith by those inside during this time? 
Did we understand God's message correctly? Well, let's see. We built the ark, yes. We preached the sermon, yes. Uh, Yes. Um, But, you know, the animals, the door, God's angel. Where could we have gone wrong? And then can you imagine what was happening outside the ark? It was a time of triumph to the world out without. The apparent delay confirmed them in the belief that Noah's message was a delusion and that the flood had never come. Notwithstanding the solemn scenes which they had witnessed, the beasts of the and the beasts and birds entering the ark and the angel of God closing the door, they still continued their sport and revelry, even making a jest of these signal manifestations of God's power. They gathered in crowds about the ark, deriding its inmates and daring violence, which they had never ventured upon before. The crowds started to get bolder and bolder in their defiance, and led more and more strongly by Satan, they started to talk of torching the ark with the persons inside. But then clouds rolled away, or clouds rolled in on the eighth day, and while they were all rallying, let's destroy those crazy people inside the ark, they suddenly felt something. What's this? Water? From the sky? You know, now, friends, for those of you who are actually living uh, uh, in California and old enough to remember in 2004, we had quite a rainstorm El Nino year, right? Remember? Um, Mike and I were freshmen at Pacific Union College, and it rained day and night for two weeks straight. I remember I felt fortunate that before going to school, my parents had bought me a huge Costco golf umbrella, you know, the kind that four to five people could get under it at at the same time. Well, I got a lot of use of that umbrella that year because I used it to walk from class to class. But despite having that huge umbrella for just little old me, my jeans were soaked from the knees down, walking from one building to the next, just less than even a hundred steps away. It was a good thing that our campus was on top of a mountain because we had so much rain that that literal waterfalls would gush down the steps of our campus. I can't even imagine what the storm was like in Noah's day, but that's why we have the writings of Ellen White. Friends, I am about to break the first law of public speaking. Don't read long quotes, but I think that you will find these passages so enthralling that you will not even notice. From Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 6, entitled The Flood, it says, There followed the muttering of thunder and the flash of lightning. Soon large drops of rain began to fall. The world had never witnessed anything like this before, and the hearts of men were struck with fear. All were secretly inquiring, Can it be that Noah was in the right and the world was doomed to destruction? Darker and darker grew the heavens, and faster and faster came the falling rain. The beasts were roaming about in the wickedest, wildest terror, and their discordant cries seemed to moan out their destiny as the, as the fate of man. Then the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Water appeared to come from the clouds in mighty cataracts. Rivers broke away from their boundaries and overflowed the valleys. Jets of water burst from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet in the air, (laughs) like these, and in falling buried themselves deeply into the ground. As the violence of the storm increased, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of the people that despised the authority of God. Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence and charged God with injustice and cruelty. Many of the people like Satan blasphemed God, and had they been able, they would have torn him from the throne of power. Others were so frantic with fear, stretching their hands towards the ark and pleading for admittance. Some in their desperation endeavored to break into the ark, but the firm made structure withstood their efforts. Some clung to the ark as they were until they were borne away by the surging waters, or their hold was broken by collision with rocks and trees. The beast exposed to the tempest, rushed toward man as if they were expecting help from him. Some of the people bound their children and themselves upon powerful animals, knowing that these animals were tenacious of life, and they would climb to the highest points to escape the rising waters. Some fastened themselves to lofty trees on the summit of hills or mountains, but those trees were uprooted, and with their burden of living things were hurled into the seething billows. One spot 
after another promised safety was abandoned. As the waters rose higher and higher, the people fled for refuge to the loftiest mountains. Often man and beast would struggle together for foothold until they both were stepped away. Wow, what a contrasted ending for two groups of people, right? One group swept away to eternal destruction and the other floating in safety, all because they made the fateful choice of either getting inside the ark or not. I believe that if we study the characteristics of both people within so that we can make the same choices they made and the people without so that we can learn from their mistakes, then we will know how to live. The people who are found outside the ark could be listed into four different categories. Number one, the scientists. Listen to what Ellen White says about these people in Patriarchs and Prophets 96 and 97. The world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had not yet passed their boundaries. They reasoned, as many reason now, that nature is above the God of nature and that her laws are so firmly established that God himself could not change them. Reasoning if that the message of Noah were correct, nature would be turned out of her course. They made that message in the minds of the world a delusion, a grand deception. They manifested their contempt for the warning of God by doing just as they had done before the warning had been given. They continued their festivities and their gluttonous feasts. They ate and drank, planted and builded, laying their plans in reference to the advantages they hoped to gain in the future. And they went to greater lengths in wickedness and to defiant disregard of God's requirements to testify that they had no fear of the infinite one. These scientists believed that the laws of nature were above those of God. They worshipped only what they could see, touch, feel, and replicate. By turning a blind eye to God as the creator of nature, they cursed themselves to only half of the story. At the time, their atmosphere was very different from ours. Nowadays, you would be hard-pressed to find even an ele early elementary student who does not know about the water cycle and its importance in sustaining the earth. A basic scientific fact now was unheard of at their time. But don't think that the antediluvians were Neanderthal, thug-headed cavemen either. No, because with about a thousand years to live, the capacity for perfect memory that people in that day were able to do much more than we are even able to fathom today, and all without the need of inventions. The scientists of the day were not evil because they were smart. No, it was because their sin led in the way that they used their intellect. They often worshiped the created rather than the creator and delighted in pushing God out of everything altogether. So, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, these types of scientists are still very much in our world today, and they are still afforded much clout today as they were seen by those who don't study enough to understand for themselves. These scientists would rather believe that life came from the minuscule chance that random particles would suddenly come together to form the basic cell, a phenomenon which has never even to this day been replicated in the laboratory, by the way. And that that same process would then happen simultaneously at quadrillion times just to form one organism, never mind that there needs to be a male and a female organism to continue to propagate. These same scientists would rather trust only in the chemistry of pharmaceutical drugs than to take accountability that the reason we have disease in the first place is largely because of the things that we do to our bodies. And if we stop doing these things that we would and live by God's principles, we can reverse and prevent many of the diseases that are plaguing our world today. These people of science would say anything and to do anything to keep from having to admit that there is a God who created us and gave us instructions to live. Because if they admitted this, they would immediately be held accountable for their actions. Already now we are faced with choices of believing in man's science versus believing in God's science. If you think that God's way is not scientific, and if you truly are wanting to learn of how to explain everything science via a Christian viewpoint, then I encourage you to contact me and we can dis continue this discussion because it is possible to reconcile God and science. The, so we see that the first type was those that rejected God's authority. The second type was a flotsam and jetsam. These people were easily influenced by any and all that they hear. These people were happy to follow the easy path, to go along with the crowd. They had no backbone. 
no firm true standard for which they used to govern their being. And they heard no, when they heard Noah's message, they were easily scared. They started to believe Noah's message, but then they talk, turned to the popular, wise, and learned. And these people, this world was arrayed by God's justice and his laws, and Noah was, was regarded as a fanatic. Satan, when tempting Eve, and Eve to disobey God, and said to her, you shall not surely die. Great men, worldly honored, and wise men repeated the same lie. The threatenings of God, they said, are for the purpose of intimidating and will never be verified. You need not be alarmed. Such an event as the destruction of the world by the God who made it and the punishment of the beings he has created will never take place. Be at, be at peace. Fear not. Noah is a wild fanatic, they said. The world made merry. Basically, it says here that the world just made fun of him. And as time passed on, those people who initially trembled at the warning, they became to, to be reassured. And they asserted that if there was any truth in what Noah had said, then the wise, the prudent, and the great men would understand the matter. So these initial, these uh, flotsam and jetsam we see had no backbone. The third were the initial converts. Because in Genesis 6, 3, it says, The Lord said, My spirit will not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. So there was a time during the 120 years that the Holy Spirit was moving among the people, impressing and convicting them towards full reconciliation with God. They were touched by, God's, uh, by Noah's message and saw the hand of God moving. They probably even helped to build the ark, some of them. But as they continued to associate with a popular crowd of unbelievers, their godly intentions started to fade. Perhaps it was a long wait of the 120 years that wearied their faith. As scoffers in 2 Peter 3, 3-4 says, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. As their faith was tested, the more and more they started to reject the message and took their ranks among the, those who scoffed Noah. Friends, unfortunately, we have some of these kind of people among us as well in the last days. Former church members, former friends, we are told will be at the forefront of those who will persecute the final church. So sad is the quote from the patriarchs and prophets when Ellen said, for none are so reckless and go to such lengths in sin as those who have once had the light and have resisted the convicting spirit of God. And the fourth, so the third were the initial converters, and these we see are the backsliders. The fourth, and probably the most sad category, was Noah's family. In Genesis 5.30, we see that Noah was the firstborn and that had many siblings after him. These siblings, having the same upbringing, attending the same church services, reading the same Sabbath school quarterly, and attending the same camp meetings, are like our own family and church family in these end days. But while Noah sat in these meetings with one Bible in one hand and a notebook in the other hand, taking notes so that he could study it out for himself later, his church family and his family members were gossiping, trying to form rela romantic relationships with one another, fighting with others regarding issues like if the food at potluck was made with meat or not, or whether the youth could go on their spiritual or on their swimming uh, um, their swimming outing on Sabbath or not. They squander away all the opportunities to grow their spiritual walk with the Lord. And they re the result was that they could not recognize the voice of God and found themselves outside the ark at the time of the flood. These people were uncommitted to God's message. Some of these people were actually saw the entrance of the Garden of Eden as it was not taken from earth until after the flood. Some of them probably even were alive to hear the stories of God from the lips of Noah and Enoch themselves. Can you imagine, friends, being so close to fully accepting all in relationship with our creator God, yet being so far that the end of time, as we are pounding on the door of the wedding feast, saying, Lord, open the door for us, we instead hear the saddest words ever heard, I don't know you. Friends, we have a time now to change that destiny should it we count it as of importance it is solely our choice let none of us experience that of those in noah's day 
From the highest peaks, men looked abroad upon a shoreless ocean. The solemn warnings of God's servant no longer seemed a subject for ridicule and scorning. How those doomed sinners longed for the opportunities which they had slighted. How they pleaded for one hour's probation, one more privilege of mercy, one call from the lips of Noah. But the sweet voice of mercy was no more heard by them. Love, no less than justice, demanded that God's judgments should put a check on sin. But what about Noah? What can we learn from him? Again, we, hear, we see in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. If Noah had skimped on building the ark or had not gathered provisions of food and supplies for himself, his family, and the animals, just think where we would be now. As a result of Noah's, Noah's faith and obedience, his whole family was saved. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, admonishes us to stay awake, watch, and be sober so that the Jesus is coming does not take us by surprise. Matthew 24 tells us that as the end times are like the times of Noah, so we, as the last day people, should look to Noah as our example to live and prepare for the coming of Jesus in the final day. God gave Noah exact instructions on how to build his ark of safety and how to make provisions for the sustenance during the flood, during those 150 days that he would be out to sea when he was no longer able to get those provisions from him for himself. Friends, there is a time when we will be cut off from earthly sustenance as well. God has given us the health message so that we can learn to live as healthfully as possible with as few pharmaceuticals as possible. He gave us the new start principle so that we can sustain the most abundant, healthful life possible. He gave us mentors who have learned to how to garden, to grow those fruits and vegetables that yielded us our, their vitality. He gave us the order to work the soil so that we can breathe deeply the fresh air and the maintain the strong, healthy muscles and bones. Now you all know that my husband and I are physicians. Of course we learn about chemical pharmacy and that we prescribe pres prescriptions, medications for those who are sick. But those who of you who know us well will also know that far more than we prescribe medications, we also seek to educate about the ways to stay healthy so that we don't get sick in the first place. In the last days, we are told in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White that the people will be cut off from all earthly support. We will not be able to buy and sell what, what we will do. What will we do when our bank accounts are frozen, our credit cards don't register, and no one takes cash anymore? How will we eat? How will we pay for our medications? For those who live through the terrors of 9-11, they can testify that these realities of have actually occurred. For those who lived through the Great Depression in the 1930s, as my great-grandfather, who farmed his own food, can tell you, he didn't feel much impact during the Depression. I have read interviews from those who have lived through the Depression that the pictures in the history books that have been ingrained in our minds, you know, the ones of all the people that were lined up almost a mile away for just that chunk of cheese or that loaf of bread, these, this phenomenon only happened in the cities. Those ones that lived in the country who were growing food them for themselves, they had no idea there was even an economic depression at the time that they were living. Also during the last days, we have all have earthly possessions stripped from us, including the Bible. The Bible is our only roadmap to knowing truth from counterfeit. You see, dear friends, that Jesus warned us in the gospel stories that even in the last days, Satan will raise false prophets and false Christ he, here and there. Satan having been God's covering cherub, no scripture backwards and forwards. So we also need to learn God's word inside and out so that when the time comes and we no longer have access to this book, that we will have downloaded its messages into our minds and so we will not fall for devil's pitfalls. The Great Controversy, which is the book detailing the last day's events on this earth, earth history, warns us on page 625 
that only those who have been diligent students of the scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the pos powerful delusion that takes the world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all testing, time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they, in such a crisis, cling to the Bible and the Bible only? And that we're coming to a close, people. Satan will, if possible, prevent them from obtaining a preparation to stand in that day. He will so arrange affairs as to hedge up their way, entangle them with earthly treasures, cause them to carry a heavy, wearisome burden, that their hearts may be overcharged with the cares of this life, and the day of trial may come on them as a thief. So, don't let the fleeing cares of this world keep you from the eternal treasures, my friends. There is no amount of money, fame, girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband, child, friend, boss, material possessions, or anything under this sun that is worth losing heaven over. If you are interested in studying these themes out further so you can be prepared, these are the sources from which I receive my information today. Of course, the Bible first and foremost, then Ellen White's writings. Did you know that her entire library is free online or free via an, um, an app? Uh, those websites are there. We can download them. Also, there is a website that was started by a couple medical school classmates of mine that offers a collection of Adventist sermons and other resources that you can stream or download at will, all for free. Friends, I promise that if you really start digging into the Word and Ellen White's writings, a whole new world of understanding will be open to you. Also listed uh, below is my email address. If you ever have any questions about anything that I can help you with, please email me. For those of you who live locally and have my cell phone, uh, cell phone uh, number, you can also text me or call me. I don't really answer some of my cell phone calls, though. Um, but you can, also, you can always text me anytime. Lastly, uh, my beloved friends, as many of you know who attend locally here, my family and I will be moving out of state in the next couple months. We are taking to heart these last day warnings and going to the mountains, the Black Hills of South Dakota, where we can live a simpler life, focus on growing our own food, shield our children from the temptation of the masses, and yet work a nearby town for Jesus as we always have. After we leave, I may do some shifts here still in California, from time to time. So I might, from time to time, still be able to visit this church. But I don't know if we will ever see each other again on this side of eternity. As the sermon closes, I beseech you not to dilly-dally any longer. If you have even one eye open to the world events surrounding us, you know that the birth pains of this world are getting stronger and stronger and more painful. Friends, we don't have a lot of time left. Let us admonish and encourage each other in Bible study and the gospel service so that we can learn to discern God's voice and then to trust and obey. Let us pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful gift of your Sabbath, a time where we can rest from our daily lives and focus on rebuilding our relationship with you. I've done my part in sharing what I believe you wanted me to share. Now, Father, I place these dear souls who are listening right now into your more than capable hands. Help, please help seal any s that are touched by your loving plan of salvation and keep these thoughts in the forefront of their minds so that they won't forget. If anyone was moved today, Father, please don't allow them to even sleep until they act on that conviction, Father and seek help in finding the God that I know, for you are a loving God who always provides for our best interests, even if discipline is involved, because you would rather correct and guide us than to lose any of us forever. I pray that you will grant us a Sabbath blessing and keep us safe until we can meet again, if not on earth, then on the other side of eternity. All these things I ask in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Our closing song is Trust and Obey, hymn number 590.